there are cracks in the ISS. The International Space Station is leaking air. We've known about this air leak for years and have done a lot to try and fix it, and we just haven't been able to. It's getting worse to the point NASA recently elevated the issue to the highest level of risk in their internal risk management system. The fact is, we don't even really understand exactly why this leak is happening, much less how to fix it. And yet, NASA is considering keeping the ISS in low Earth orbit past 2030. Is that even possible at this point? What are the major issues facing the ISS? Is the deorbit plan to have SpaceX design and build a new vehicle in just five years feasible? Will private space stations even be ready by 2030? And what happens if Russia doesn't agree to all of this, as they're only committed to the ISS through 2028? I'm Swapna Krishna, and today on Ad Astra, we're going to talk about the clunky, aging, but beloved International Space Station. A report came out in the last few weeks from the NASA Office of the Inspector General that basically outlines the risks of operating the ISS through 2030 or possibly beyond. Right now, the ISS is scheduled for retirement in 2030 with a controlled deorbit in early 2031. For more on the deorbit plan and the SpaceX USDV or US deorbit vehicle and why we can't save the ISS as a museum, check out my video on that. But NASA has also made clear that they don't want to retire the ISS if there's nothing to take its place. They want to hand the torch over to commercial space stations that can continue the work of the ISS in low Earth orbit. And they want those stations in orbit before the end of life of the ISS. That means that the contingency plan that NASA is currently working on is an indefinite extension of the ISS's life past 2030. They don't especially want to do this, and it's not the primary plan, but it's a very real and honestly likely possibility. The question we're all wondering is, can the ISS even handle that? The International Space Station is not in great shape, and every year that goes by, it gets worse. The air leak in question is located in the Zvezda service module on the Russian side of Space Station, and it's the third oldest module on the ISS after Zarya and Unity. Zvezda launched in July of 2000. If you know how spacecraft work, Zvezda is basically the ISS's service module. It provides power, life support, docking ports for Progress cargo modules and Soyuz spacecraft, sewage processing, and is the primary source for the ISS's propulsion systems. It is the main heart uh, of the space station. It was also the first computers that came up here that ran the space station. And so behind this wall right here are these main computers. So we gather here as a group of three or six and then figure out how we're going to either fight the fire, patch the hole, or solve the, uh, the toxic spill. It's not all that surprising that one of the early Russian modules is the one that's falling apart. These early modules have undergone significant stress as the ISS has been expanded and added to. Plus, the original structural frame of Zvezda dates back to the mid-1980s. I think it was completed in 1986. Zvezda was originally intended as a successor to the Mir space station called Mir 2. At the time of launch, Russians was so strapped for cash that they launched Zvezda on a rocket emblazoned with the Pizza Hut logo, for which the company reportedly paid a million dollars. The first U.S. module, Harmony, was also modified from what was supposed to be a U.S. space station. Guess who built that module? The Boeing Company. If you're getting the sense here that the construction of the ISS was a little haphazard, you're not wrong. Everyone was basically scrambling to repurpose plans and hardware from their individual space stations that didn't pan out. Knowing all of this, it's not really surprising that 24 years later, the ISS is falling apart a little bit. Let's dive into the specifics of that air leak. But first, managing everything on the ISS has got to be a huge headache. I have to wonder what kind of productivity software they're using. I have enough of a headache just managing my organization for this channel, the newsletter, vertical video, and the other projects I'm working on. 
I have tried pretty much every piece of software out there, and I feel like I spend more time trying to figure out what I need to get done than actually doing it. Then I tried ClickUp, the sponsor of this video, and everything, pardon the pun, clicked. One of the struggles I had with other software is that it allowed you to get very granular, but there was no high-level view to be able to look at everything going on at once. That's why I love ClickUp's Everything View. It gives me one place to look at everything I have going on. I don't have to spend my time digging through views to find my tasks. They're just there in front of me, and I can get immediately started on what I need to work on. And I can break down projects as much as I need to. When I'm creating a video for Ad Astra, I have steps I need to do consistently for every video, and they need to be done by a certain date for me to publish on time. ClickUp lets me track each of these tasks in a project, but it also saves me time because I can save a project template and easily replicate it every time I have a new video. And to me, aesthetics matter just as much as functionality. I like that ClickUp is an attractive and well-designed platform, and you can tell the people who designed it actually use it. they are all different kinds of views, boards, calendars, and the key was I could just dive in and start using it. I didn't have to go through a tutorial or a learning process because it's designed intuitively. To try ClickUp for free, go to tryclickup.co slash adastra or just click on the link below in the description. If you love it so much you want to upgrade to a paid plan, ClickUp will email you a discount if you use this link. Thank you to ClickUp for sponsoring this video. Okay, so what's going on with this air leak? NASA has known about it since 2019. It is located in a vestibule that separates a progress docking port from the rest of the service module called the Service Module Transfer Tunnel, and the leak has gotten progressively worse. I say leak in the individual, but that's technically inaccurate because we're talking about multiple leaks of varying sizes. Some of them, NASA and Roscosmos have been able to pinpoint the source and do work mitigating or fixing them. Others, they haven't been able to pinpoint. This has been going on for five years, and everything has just gotten worse. The ISS normally leaks a lot of air in its normal day-to-day -day operations. The stable leak rate is around 0.6 pounds mass of air per day. Anything above that requires NASA and Roscosmos to investigate the source. Well, in September of 2019, that rate increased dramatically to 1.2 pounds per day. Then a year later, it increased again to 3 pounds per day. In 2022, NASA and Roscosmos identified multiple air leak sources and fixed them, but only managed to bring the air leak rate down to 1.7 pounds per day. And that's how they functioned for years, with this leaky vestibule. At this point, we know that the service module transfer tunnel is cracking. That's why it's leaking. But why is it cracking when nowhere else on the station seems to have that problem, including other areas that are just as old as this tunnel? That's the mystery. They've basically ruled out a debris or micrometeoroid strike. Is it defective workmanship? Is it stress from docking and undocking? The analysis says, based on what the service module transfer tunnel has experienced, it shouldn't be in this state. Yet it is. So something is going on. The location of the leak is actually incredibly lucky, honestly, because it can be sealed off by an airlock to mitigate air loss. Right now on the ISS, they keep the hatch on that area closed, and so it doesn't really impact day-to-day -day functioning of the ISS. If the leak gets significantly worse and they feel like it's a present danger, they can just close off the tunnel completely and permanently. They would lose a valuable progress docking port, but it is a good option. But without understanding why these cracks are happening, it remains a serious danger to the astronauts and cosmonauts aboard the ISS and severely complicates any plan to extend the life of space station. Especially because the leak is getting worse. Both NASA and Roscosmos maintain that the condition of the service tunnel transfer module isn't an immediate risk to the structural integrity of the ISS. But in February of this year, the leak rate increased again to 2.4 pounds per day. And then two months later, it went up again to 3.7 pounds. NASA and Roscosmos have done work to mitigate this leak rate. The current leak rate isn't clear, but some repairs have been done, and Russia is limiting operations in the area and keeping the hatch closed when the airlock isn't in use. 
but also another problem. NASA and Roscosmos haven't actually agreed on what the highest maximum acceptable leak rate is, which means that there is no consensus on the point at which that part of the space station needs to be sealed off permanently. This is a hard situation, and it's just one of the problems facing the ISS right now. There are others that are a real problem when it comes to the idea of extending ISS operations past 2030. Right now, there really isn't a viable private space station that looks like it will be ready by then, which means it's very possible NASA will be looking to extend ISS operations. Let's talk about one of the practical problems with that. Russia hasn't agreed to any plan to extend ISS operations past 2030, and core modules of the ISS are dependent on one another. You can't separate the US and Russian parts of the ISS and use them independently. We can't keep the ISS in orbit without the Zvezda module's thrusters and the boosts that the Progress spacecraft provide. Right now, as the ISS is configured, without the Russian Progress spacecraft, we cannot keep the ISS in orbit. We are dependent on Russia in other ways, too. Many times over the course of the history of the ISS, the Russian Soyuz has been the only way to get NASA astronauts to and from the International Space Station, from the grounding of the shuttle fleet after the Columbia disaster to the long period between the end of the Space Shuttle program and the launch of SpaceX's Crew Dragon. And still, we don't have redundancy. The U.S. only has one operational crew spacecraft to take astronauts to and from the ISS. And as of right now, NASA still hasn't decided when Boeing Starliner will fly again and if there will be another crewed test flight required. We're looking at June of 2025 for them even to make that final decision. Three times in the past few months, the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket has been grounded after anomalies with the second stage or after landing the booster. They've all been relatively short periods. The longest one was only about two weeks. But right now, the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket is the only way we have to get crew to and from the space station besides the Soyuz. What is even worse is that it is also the only way we have to get cargo to and from the ISS besides the progress. SpaceX holds one of the commercial cargo contracts with their Dragon spacecraft. Northrop Grumman's Cygnus vehicle is the other spacecraft that resupplies the ISS. But they're currently in between rockets waiting on the new Antares that's supposed to debut next year. Until it does, the Cygnus is launching on a SpaceX Falcon 9. The Falcon 9 is literally the only way the U.S. has to get crew or cargo to the ISS. No matter what the company is, that kind of dependence on one launch vehicle is not good, and none of NASA's plans for redundancy have gone well. If you're wondering about the NASA cargo contract with the Sierra Space Dream Chaser, that vehicle is delayed. We're hoping the first flight there will be in 2025. Again, as I've said multiple times, SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket is a great and reliable launch vehicle. It is unquestionably the workhorse of the global launch industry. These anomalies have been minor, and none of them have affected the mission. But again, this kind of dependence on one launch vehicle is just really not good. And if Boeing Starliner has taught us anything, after that whole return without spacesuits contingency plan, it's that having an extra spacecraft docked to the ISS for an emergency is a good thing. We just don't have the capability or the money for that, frankly, at the moment. Right now, there are still crew swaps going on between cosmonauts and astronauts. One NASA astronaut trains with a Russian crew and flies on a Soyuz, and vice versa. But this cooperation is scheduled to end in 2025, though NASA is negotiating with Roscosmos to extend it. That's not the only issue facing a possible extension to the life of the ISS. The ISS is increasingly vulnerable to micrometeoroid and debris strikes as it ages. A micrometeoroid strike is likely what damaged a Soyuz capsule in 2022 and led to NASA astronaut Frank Rubio's record-breaking spaceflight, an extension from six months to over a year because Russia had to send up a second Soyuz vehicle to bring the astronauts back. And more and more parts on the ISS need to be replaced. Have you ever tried replacing a part on something that's over 20 years old? A lot of the time, it's just easier to replace something than try and find that replacement part. But that's not an option with the ISS. 
The core modules weren't designed to be replaced or swapped out, so NASA is doing their best to order and have replacement parts on hand, but it's getting more tricky. Back in June, NASA actually had to pull some of Butch and Sonny's personal belongings off Boeing Starliner because they had to get a replacement urine pump part up to the ISS as soon as possible. Until that processor got fixed, astronauts were just having to store urine, which is not a viable long-term solution. You might have been asking, why don't they just have this replacement part on board if it's so crucial? This is why. They're hard to come by and are taking an increasingly long time to get and are getting more expensive. As the ISS gets older and older, this is going to become a bigger problem. Which brings me to the budget issues. NASA is already canceling programs left and right because they aren't in a good budget environment. The ISS costs NASA about $4.1 billion a year for operations and research, which is around 16% of NASA's budget. That's a huge cost that's going to just increase as the ISS gets older. And it's unclear if NASA can even afford to extend ISS operations past 2030. They don't seem to have the budget for it right now. The ISS was originally scheduled for deorbit in 2015, and that's been extended through 2020 and 2024. The question is, will it happen again? It's not like NASA can make that decision unilaterally. The ISS is managed by NASA, Roscosmos, the CSA, Canadian Space Agency, JAXA, Japanese Space Agency, and the ESA, European Space Agency. All of the partners except Russia have agreed to extending the ISS's lifetime through 2030. Russia is only in right now until 2028. If at this point you're asking yourself, wait, if Russia is currently only committed through 2028, what's going to happen between 2028 and 2030? You are at the same place I am. Let's say the life of the ISS isn't going to be extended and we're all sticking with that 2030 date. The plan is to start the end of life process for the ISS with progress spacecraft and then finish the deorbit with the US deorbit vehicle built by SpaceX. Except as the NASA Office of the Inspector General points out, it takes an average of eight and a half years from the awarding of a contract for a new vehicle to have its first operational flight. Now the USDV is intentionally based on Heritage Dragon hardware. They're just going to add some propulsion and other systems to the trunk of the spacecraft. That will certainly cut down on development time. But this contract was awarded in June of 2024. There are a lot of questions about whether the vehicle will be ready in time because it needs to launch in 2030. If not, we will have to delay deorbit until it is ready. And again, Russia is only committed through 2028. Earlier this year, the US and Russia signed an agreement about their roles and responsibilities if an emergency deorbit of the ISS was required, which is a good thing because the thing weighs 925,000 pounds or 420,000 kgs, and we don't want it coming down in an uncontrolled manner. But Russia hasn't agreed to the current deorbit plan. That doesn't mean they won't, to be clear, but until they do, there will be a lot of uncertainty around all this because NASA can't do anything solo. This is a lot of information, but I hope it gives you a good idea of why the fate of the ISX, extend or deorbit, is so complicated. For now, that is all I have to tell you about the International Space Station. Thank you for watching. I am Swapna Krishna, and this is Ad Astra.